Hello and welcome back to another part of Camroglyphics, where we run through how you can read Egyptian hieroglyphics using the Welsh language as the key. This one is one of the most interesting in my view and gives some of the most comprehensive proof, if that's the right word, evidence that Welsh seems to be the language. At the very least, it works and the language they use must have been freakily similar. Now, before we go any further, just want to thank everybody for the feedback I've been getting. So many great emails. Everyone's so positive. People are trying it. People are learning things. I've had some new ideas contributed. Thank you to um, Darren on that one uh, and other people. And also people ask quickly, can I show something about the book? And one of the questions from Sue, are the examples you're giving here the same ones as in the book? I'm going to try and just change quickly if I can. Uh, whoop, here we go. So I've got, as an example, here's a chapter we did, which was um, whoop, uh, reading and writing names. This is more or less how it appears in the book. It's a draft. And the examples are different. So what you get, a bit of introduction text, and then lots and lots and lots of examples for you to do. Have a go. Try it out yourself. And then what you do then is you propose solutions. Uh, so there's Sarah. For example, the supreme one, a very simple one, but you could do it this way. There's options. I don't want to spoil this for people who haven't seen the book yet, but if you have got the book, you'll know there's some fun ones in there, celebrities, names you might recognize, stuff like that. Okay, so we go clug, 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 and they all get an explanation. And that's very much the format. The book's really much a you-have-to-do-it kind of book with the idea you learn by doing. There's explanation information that you need and then is learned by doing okay and you can see the workings they're all worked out so you can see how it's done all right so let's go on to this what's called uh, titles or prenoms which just means it comes before the name which is where these are observed and it's some of the most famous and iconic hieroglyphs that you see in many many places and some of the famous combinations what they mean okay so here's one famous one and it's one of my absolute favorites and what we have here, very simply, is the sun and a goose. I know in some uh, some Egyptologists like to think of it as a pintail duck. It doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, from their point of view, it's just this symbol. But from our point of view, it is important because this is a goose. And goose is another one of these wonderful dual meaning words in Welsh. Because the word for goose is guith, and from that the word has the dual meaning of a prescience, a sort of a, an awareness or a knowledge. And there's God. So you've got awareness of God. It's fantastic. But it gets better. Because up here we got the sun, which is Ra. And if you take the middle part of that, you get Ra Gwith. So you combine that, Ra Gwith, which in Welsh means the Lord, as you say in church. When you go to church, it's Ra Gwith when you pray. So here we go, let's go through it. Sun and goose combined, the overall ra with. And I explain, because here's the sun, okay? So we've got ra, ra, with, ra, with. So that sounds the same. Ra, with, ra, with. The Lord and Master. The sun's an interesting one, by the way, because in the ancient Welsh Druidic tradition, they're not sun worshippers, but they believed that God lived in the sun. So some of you just have the sun. And this is my interpretation. I mean, different people have different views. This represents God being in the sun. So either way, it's the sun. Okay. And you'll see this backed up by Constantine with the, the suns behind the horse's heads and references back to Welsh Christianity and Druidism, that kind of thing. So we got Ra, which is the power. The power, the God Ra, you know, Ra. Fair play, got that right. And then we got Gwyd which is the goose, and with, which means presence or cognition, it's like awareness of, so it's the, the presence or the uh, awareness or presence of the Lord, fantastic, put them together, you've got um, Araglwith, which I think is just wonderful, and you tell this to Welsh speakers and you see their eyes sort of go, oh my goodness, that's so powerful, so let's go through it, you've got Araglwith, so phonetically the same as Araglwith, which is the Lord or Master. Oops, excuse me, let's go back one, sorry. Let's go back. 
Oh, previous slide, where are you? Previous slide. There we go. So in conventional decipherment, a goose... Oh, yes, go through what the conventional version is. They say it represents the son of. And with the son representing a god, you get the goose and son is said to be the son of god. Which, you know, not, not, it's not that bad, actually. <laughs> it's not working from anything. The problem is they don't know why a goose is a son. But there you go. The son makes sense, but the goose, or duck as it is sometimes referred to, meaning son of, son of, that should be, seems to have been deduced to match the places where it is seen. Now, this is great, actually, for us, because this is confirmation that the Cumberglyphics translation does actually fit with the context and where they spent the last 200 years looking at all the places that they found it and come into a conclusion. And the conclusion matches what we found by actually reading the words from a dictionary, which is how you really should translate something. Here's another very popular one. Again, it's used as a prenorm, as a title. Uh, mostly, you do see it, sometimes see it, but that's generally what it is. It can be in text. This, you recognise what that is? Oh, once again, I hope you like the drawings. They're all done by me. Um, no copyrights, as far as I'm concerned. These symbols are 4,000 years old. How can I copyright them? <laughs> I can copyright the drawings, but I'm not going to anyway. Help yourself. Please give me a name check if you can, and a credit for Cumberglyphics. But hey, just use the names, the, the drawings, if you wish to. Right. So here's a um, mosquito. All right. Got the telltale things here, mosquito. And this, sometimes people think it's a reed. We're going to go with leek. All right. And you see different versions of this. And some look more like a leek than this one. Uh, right. Now, one of the problems conventional decipherments had, this is not always a mosquito. Sometimes it could be a bee. There's other insects. It's drawn very differently, and try and explain it as style things and that kind of stuff. But you have to work out why is it sometimes a bee, sometimes a mosquito, sometimes something else. You have to think a bit. See, Wilson and Blackett, they've got this amazing mind where they just seem to work these things out. But have a think about that. What links all those different insects. Well, I'll give you a bigger clue. They all bite or sting, but the answer we're looking for is not biting or stinging. Clever stuff. And down here, once again, we see these. We'll see these a lot. As we know, it's the cake. It's the T-U-R, the Titian lap. All right, let's go on to that one. So here we go. So let's go through the conventional first, okay? So they split into two halves. So there's the leek half. So actually, this is the leek appears on top of the, the cake. And this which is, the, um, you know, novio to keep, is not there. So the actual meaning of this combination, nusu, however you pronounce, pronounce that, I don't know. See, again, this is a great example. This is three words, yeah? So this is the message to you who keeps. That's what that's. This is another combination. The message to you who keeps. Whereas nusu is trying to make this work as a word, as letters, and they're not. So it's obscure as it is, as it's reading. Although it's etymology, and that means the history of how they worked out what the word means, is one who belongs to the reeds. I mean, I don't know where they get this from. I suppose that looks a bit like a reed. And that's water. I don't know. May may hint at, look at this, may hint at an association with the myth of Horus and the symbolism of places and temples. It may hint at. This is not exactly speaking with certainty. They're not translating here. They, they, they're taking educated guesses. It's called deduction. As for the other half of the symbol, there's a stinging insect. There's the T. As for bitty, again, they're trying to make a word out of letters, when it's actually two words. It is another word for king. No explanation given. One thing I noticed in all these um, Egyptology books and hieroglyphics books, there's never a reference where this word is worked out or how they did it. It just is, right? This is another word for king. All been, this is a direct quote, by the way. This isn't from my writing. This is f directly from the book. And this book is Bill Manley's Egyptian Hieroglyphs for Complete Beginners, 2012. So it's a recent book, all right? This is current thinking. So anyway, all being a different aspect, whatever that means, as the mortal presence as opposed to, I suppose, the holy presence. Or the, but its meaning is even more obscure. The combination, this altogether, Nasubiti, is usually nowadays translated as dual king. Look at this again here. Usually, usually, it's not known for certain. And different Egyptologists have different interpretations of what this can mean. And because there's no definitive answer. Whoop. 
we just do two then sorry i apologize oh that's right anyway so let's go through the camera glyphics this was the genius of wilson and blackett this is sting or pain they all bite they give you pain pain is the key pain is nachi the intended word nacha which is to behold this is genius right here's the leak sometimes it looks like this sometimes like this which is kenin which gives us kenad which is message and I want you to remember this shape particularly because this appears as a very useful thing in the pictograms when we come on to those. And you'll find people with their noses drawn like this. Like a leak. You know, there'll be an eye there, an eye there, and the eyelids and everything. So a nose and two eyebrows is the leak Kenin Kenad message. And we'll see that in the pictograms. So we'll look out for later. And they also notice in uh, Manley's explanation in all the conventional. These things are just kind of sitting there, these cakes. They don't know what they're there for. They're just a symbol. Whereas we know from Cameroglyphics, they're two cakes, which is Titian, you are, and the dual meaning, because it's do. It's two, right? So, do it, ruler you are. The ruler you are. So, or behold a message from the ruler. Fantastic. So, we then need to consider the buckets from containers are always shown at the bottom. I've just done this already. As we know from previous translations, a pair of items denotes ruler, and in this case, the two cakes signify Titian, T, distinctly you are. W and B translate this as behold a message, distinctly you are the ruler. You can also put a slightly different twist on it, which can also mean that T, can also mean that is, and as an alternative would be behold a message that is from the deity. When seen like this, the symbols make perfect sense, regardless of what stinging or biting insect is shown. Another mystery solved using cumnoglyphics. Now, this mystery, these tend to get ignored. I've shown you a couple of times they appear sometimes in front of Cleopatra's name. There's other ones you'll see in the book, Bernica and uh, various other places. Why do we have these two? They always seem to be with a female ruler. So we've got you are there, the T. So what we have to do is work out what this shape is and what it refers to and why it would be there for a princess. Now, Wilson and Blackett go for egg. Now, the way I've drawn this, on some of the hieroglyphs particularly, this is more pronounced. This is more of a point. And in some of them, like in um, one of the ones in the Louvre, you actually see a little... You have to really look at these. And I th what really helped me, I think, in this whole project was redrawing every single hieroglyph from scratch by hand. And I think... I don't know, just immerse yourself in the subject. I mean, I read hieroglyphs now. It's like reading anything, you know? It's... Um, you've got to really immerse yourself in it and it starts to come to life like if you read books every day you don't think about the words anymore but this to me looks a little bit like something wilson and blackett mentioned and hint to um they call it giraffe great old word d-r-a-f-f giraffe and giraffe is considered more today a bit of a waste product from the brewing process but um it's when you get swollen husks uh, which end up this shape I was going to put some pictures on there, but you can look, if you look up giraffe, you'll see what I mean. And they use it a lot today for animal feed, but it's also a crucial part of the brewing process. And the Egyptians are mad keen beer brewers. <laughs> they were big on brewing. So this might be a rare sight for us today, but it would be more common for them. Or it's an egg, as Wilson and Blackett go for. So we'll show you both ways it works pretty well. Let's have a look. Okay, so what we have here, I'm going to go with chaff, first of all which is my preferred version. So we've got the cake and the chaff. So we've got T, soy guess. Put those words together into one long word. And what do we have? To is soy guess, which is the Welsh word for princess or female ruler. And that's still the same word today. If you go and see uh, um, some hospitals, they got uh, opened by the princess of Wales. You see to is soy guess, Cymru on there. This is the word for princess, which is, makes perfect sense why that should be. Uh, in front of the names of princesses or female rulers. Okay, so we get this U R. You know this already. Tish and Lap T U R. And then I would say the swollen grain is giraffe gets soygus. But let's not write off the egg just yet because egg in Welsh is oi. Oh yeah, the other bit was swollen grain giraffe. Soygus is giraffe. Okay, the the intended word from soygus is soygen. And that gives swaggy female. When I found out in the dictionary, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. Swaggy's an old word. You know, don't use it at all these days. And it's kind of like confident and a bit cocky. 
It's a great word. Might be a little bit insult in some formats, but if you're talking about you are the ruler, you got this aura, you know, the confident swagger. You are swaggy. So I think it's wonderful. The swaggy female, the princess, the female ruler. Wow, what a great way of putting things. So I'll go with this. T Sogez. For that to get two cigars, princess. And also we've got the idea of this swaggy you are, you know, this sort of uh, you've got swagger. If it's an egg, though, it's not quite a done deal just yet. Twist. You just look at that, because uh, Wilson and Black, it tend to go from twist. You get twist or gez. It could be right. They're better than me at this stuff. It does seem a little bit of an ex extension to add. Whereas, phonetically, twist. Which is twist. Twist. Tuis. 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 Means jewel or, or beautiful. So that actually could be it. It could actually be an egg, and it's just twist. It's jewel or beautiful. So there you go. Now, I really want to emphasize the difference here between the, con the what they call it, um, deduction and conjecture and context that the conventional uses, where almost any word can work. Remember, in the introduction, all the way back to Champollion, where he made that fateful decision that a hieroglyph can mean one thing in one place, something completely different somewhere else. Therefore, you pretty much put whatever word you like, wherever you like. It's been a disaster. You know, you give the same piece to six different experts, you get six different translations. Completely different. It's not the same as here, when we are looking at the finer points. I like to think of this a bit like someone uh, translating a piece from, say, French to English. Two translators will get slightly different uh, inferences and subtleties about the translation. Both will be competent in French. Both the translations will make sense. They'll just have a slight difference in interpretation. That's where the word comes from, or, or emphasis. Where it's more like that here. We're working from a dictionary and a framework and from knowing what the words mean and subtle differences, as opposed to, well, I saw this on the side of a temple. The temple was near a lake, therefore I think it's the lake god. That kind of logic. It really is that bad sometimes. Right, okay. Another one, very, very well known. Sometimes with this, the ankh, the life symbol... And sometimes not. Sometimes just these three. And this occurs in text a lot, and as a prenom, and as a title. And it's very important. All right, so we've got the big snake here wrapping around the whole thing. Then you got you. Oh, hang on a second. Let's go back one. Sorry, I'm getting used to different different way using PowerPoint. So, okay, you got the U R. This very important. This occurs a lot. Is man from place. We get ma. But man is mark. Then we get ma, which is place. Uh, so you are of this place. Okay. This is where the snake comes in. It's wonderful. It's yet neither. From that we get nard or neither, which is you are not. It's not. It's the negative. Rapid is strong. It's a negative. So not of this place you are. Not of this place of you are. So your life, not of this place you are. It's telling you it's a god. Okay. We'll come on to that in a bit more detail. So, uh, this is from my book. Uh, actually, no. Uh, yes, from my book. No. Conventionally, this common com combination has been deduced from where it is usually seen to mean living enduringly. That's the conventional translation, on a modern one anyway. This is 1998, Collier and Manley, their How to, he How to Read Hieroglyphs. And they're published by the British Museum Press, the gods of hieroglyphics. So you can accept this as the mainstream. It says living enduringly. See that's ah oh, see that's a big difference to being a god, isn't it? Not of this life is not quite the same as living forever or whatever this means, living enduringly. But they've done that through amazing work. These are clever guys. I mean, Manley particularly, he's a genius. He's a brilliant teacher and lecturer. And somehow he's managed to make this system which is incredibly complicated, using the long wrong language, I would say, and not really any logic to it. He's he's managed to teach people how to use it. I mean, hats off, the guy's, you know, a hundred times a lecturer I'll ever be. But that doesn't make the information right, unfortunately. Be working with a with a bad stack of cards there. So applying cumroglyphics, a more precise definition is found, which is a more direct and slightly different meaning. The large snake Nidea gives a negative not for the items it encloses. As these items read, you are of this place, the snake tells us that this person is not of this place or land i.e. not of the earth. 
and hence immortal or a god. This is even more powerful when combined with the life symbol. Remember the Ankh symbol came just before it. So you are life, but not of this earth. Okay, so here we have it. There's the Ankh. Breath of life or life, an adult. Not, not you of this earth, of this place, of this country. You know, you're a god. It's a fantastic statement. Much more than you kind of endure for a long time. Anyway, sometimes the titles are statements of the origins and status of a foreign ruler. This next example from Wilson of Blackett precedes the name of what is known as the Pharaoh Smendes, but who Wilson of Blackett claim is actually Hercules, who is the eldest son of Alexander the Great. And if you're interested in Alexander the Great and that period of Macedonian history or Greek Macedonian history um, and the arrival 322 BC in Egypt, Wilson and Blackett have tracked down where Alexander's tomb is and all his family, the whole dynasty, are in Siwa. And he explains, and you can read all the different, oh, that's great, you can read all the names and all the different uh, tombs and who they're for. And his favourite is there, you know, his boyfriend. Uh, then his, um, you can, I'll tell you, we'll do one of the lectures. I'll run through some of them. Uh, we'll see Roxanne, for instance, how that's written in hieroglyphs. And now you can see Alexander and Roxanne on the same piece of jewellery, things like that. It's it's so much physical evidence, uh, and oh, it all fits together. Trust me, get into this, you'll love it. All right, so we're one more. I think it's the last one. So this is another common combination. Wilson and Blackett have noticed this tends to come from foreigners or invaders. And here we go. Is the banner, Banon, exalted person. It's another life sign. You are, and we've got two fertile lands. Now with this one, we've got another dual meaning here. So we have to think a bit. It's a bit like a pictogram. We'll come on to more of this when we do pictograms. Because this is the fertile land. This is the land, yeah, the place. Ma. Or man, for a mark. And this is the little seeds, you see? That's how I see it, anyway. The little seeds are waiting to come and split up. And you can see blooming. Then there's some with flowers on the top end, which is blooming. Ploidae. As opposed to uh, Ploidae, which we come on to in a second. But there's two of them as well. So that it implies ruler, okay? But also, Egypt is known as the two lands, the two fertile lands. So this combination is very, very uh, powerful, okay? And this is to keep. So we keep in the two fertile lands. All right. Or the shelter. Okay, so let's go through it. So there's the banner. I got mostly right. Banier, Banon, exalted person. Special, all right? Special. This is an adult special who conceals or shelters. And this is where we get the fertile land. Uh, Freudlon. And don't worry about pronunciations or be an expert in Welsh. As you've worked out by now, no doubt, I am not a Welsh speaker. I am not an expert in Welsh. I am learning. I think the Say Something in Welsh website is a fantastic place to learn. But you don't need to be an expert in Welsh to do this. All you need to be able to do is open a dictionary and read what the words are, just like you would any other language in the modern world. Okay, so we've got Freud is to succeed. So this... I mean, two of these is like uh, a ruler, he's successful, it's the two lands, it's got a bunch of meanings all thrown in. That's how clever they are. And once you get to the pictograms, they're even more clever. Some of the double and triple meanings there are fantastic. If you're not convinced yet already, Welsh is the language and Camaroglyphics works, wait till you do pictograms, you'll be mind blown. Oh, sorry, I've got another one. Oh, yeah, the one I showed in the opening caption right at the beginning of the presentation. What is commonly known as the two old ladies. Here's one version I found. There we are. You've got the vulture. There's a cobra with the, the wide breast, which gives you the clue. It is a vulture, a cobra, sorry. And again, two baskets, which get completely ignored in the mainstream, as we'll see. Here's a drawing I've done, copying it from somewhere else. This is style things, you know. It's still a vulture, still a cobra, and still the two baskets, okay? There's one version of it. Here's another version of it. Okay, so this is one of the most famous hieroglyphic com combinations in the Egyptology world, often referred to as the two ladies. So if you want to see lots of examples, go on your search engine, type in hieroglyphics, the two ladies, and you get loads of them, all right? And read some of the explanations. Some are amazing. Anyway, it's puzzled researchers for many years and has been the source of many theories. The symbols are of a vulture and a cobra sitting on baskets and are frequently seen together. In fact, nearly always seen together in that little shape before. Due to them usually appearing before cartouches, it is generally accepted that they are some sort of title or prenom. 
The difficulty has been trying to work out exactly what the vulture and the cobra signify. A lot of ideas have been put forward for the two ladies, with the baskets they sit on usually ignored. So let's have a look. The general mainstream idea is that as Egypt is considered to consist of two kingdoms, upper and lower, the two symbols must represent one each, and this combination has been dubbed the two ladies. The introduction made is that the vulture, yeah, and I think the reason they chose which way around was because they found more vultures in one place, which means something else, as you see in a minute. Anyway, the deduction made is that the vulture is said to read as wadget. I love that word, wadget. Some of the words they come up with are great. And it's another one of those ones where the vowels of convenience have been added to WDJT, because you can't say wadget. So wadget. And shows the lord of Upper Egypt, uh, which is the south. Remember, it's upside down because of the way the Nile flows. And the cobra is said to read as nekbet. It's another one of these made-up words. It's great. Representing Lower Egypt, uh, which is going north. Um, sorry, yes. Hang on a second. I'll get this slightly right. Uh, yes, representing Lower Egypt, which is around the Nile Delta region. Okay. So anyway, Wilson and Blackett noticed that they've only seemed to appear next to the names of foreign rulers or rulers that have invaded rather than inherited the title. If you look through Egyptian history, it's a succession of invasions. Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, all through their history they've been run over. Uh, it's difficult for the you know, Egyptian uh, pride to accept it, but a lot of what happened there was actually foreign. A lot of the pyramids, the languages, uh, are by the invaders. Much that you might see the English language in a country like India and statues of Victoria. It doesn't mean say they're Indian. Anyway, come on to that in future talks. Okay, so cabroglyphics is suddenly all makes sense because a vulture, a daring rebus, rebus is the key word, rebiant is to take forcibly. Isn't that wonderful? Now Alan Wilson, his book Mose and Hieroglyphs, went for boitatai, which is, must be a very old word for vulture, because it's not in the dictionaries I've got, but it's older than that, which is greedy eater, and he gets birth to thrust in violently. The overall sense, again, is the same, with just shades, you know. Taken forcibly, I like for an invader, thrust in violently, no real difference. There's, um, sometimes you see them appearing like this. So, Keb, Kebra, which is Cobra. Kebra gives us Kibusta, which is tethered. So, you've got the captured ones here. All right, so you've got the, um, so the words are to take forcibly and capture. And uh, Wilson and Black and I have a slight slightly different views on how you can read this. Right, so Basket and Katina. Kethluun gives Kel, concealed or sheltered, or deity. But we've got two of them. So we get the, we get the deities. You've got the ruler that shelters. Because you've got this shelter and you've got two mixed ruler. So the um, Wilson and Blackett one very much is like those taken, um, those who invaded and those who were captured are both sheltered by the divine ruler. Okay. So it says here, Wilson and Blackie, the full translation is those who are tethered and sheltered by the deity and those who did the invasion are sheltered by the deity. And that's in Moses in the hieroglyphs. I, the ruler, protects the invaders and the invaded. To show I'm not just a fanboy and just take everything they say and not question. I have a slightly different way of looking at it. Um, if you look at the word um, for God, it can be just do. But the full version is actually do kel. Now, Kel ties in with the buckets, doesn't it? All the baskets. So this matches perfectly with two buckets. Doi, two, yeah, do, doi, kelun. So doi, kel, and the word God ruler can be read directly from the hieroglyphs. So I think that's why we see two buckets together so often. All right, don't forget, this is a very young subject. Basically, Wilson and Blackett have studied it and taken it so far, and I've studied it and taken it so far. It's a huge subject. We're crying out and pleading for academics to get involved. More people to make contributions. I've already had feedback from the first two videos where people are pointing out things they've seen. And it's like, great, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. And if you find a new definition, I'll put your name next to it in the, in the reference in the dictionary. The lot. Uh, if you get a college to look at it, some academics, even better. You know, let's make this a mainstream subject. Swansea University, for example, teaches Welsh. It's got an Egyptology department become world leaders now to read hieroglyphs things like that we want to see happening anyway this could mean so i'm looking at this um so doi doi kelun means you've got the god ruler 
You can read it straight off the two baskets at the bottom. So this could mean that the shelter part of the translation actually is unnecessary. It's just doikel. Just read it as you see it. And it could also have this, again, dual meaning. He also shelters, you know, he protects. So the version I prefer is overpowering and tethering supreme one. Or conqueror, perhaps. So that's when I came up with a couple of years ago. So both translations work with the system and both make perfect sense. Compare this straightforward phrase with the conventional explanation. Right, here we go. This is from E.A. Wallace Budge, say the most famous person apart from Champollion in the whole of, well, Egyptology really, and hieroglyphics, wrote big dictionaries. His books, and in case you think, I think this was written in 1898, you think I'm using old information, this book, First Steps in Egyptian by E.A. Budge, you go on Amazon or something or search for a book, this still is one of the V big sellers. This is the, uh, what's the word, standard text. Anyway, it's what he has for a female bearing woman and mother and time and sky. They all come, they're all, vulture means all of these things. So that's nice. If you're a mother, you're a vulture, okay? Now, notice this in his book. There's the princess symbol, you see it? There's the female. There it is. Twist, so I guess. Anyway, so that becomes mutt. Mother is the common meaning of a vulture. And at times, the goddess mutt seems to be identified with this little combination. Nut, the sky. See, this is frustrating here because these Wallace Budge don't take things the wrong way. He is one of my heroes. What he did with hieroglyphs is amazing. What he worked out was incredible. And I think he knew that it was the wrong language. And he, and he gives so many... Well, not even hidden messages. People just don't read his stuff. Read the introduction to his book. It's a brilliant introduction. It tells you this is guesswork. We don't know. We don't know the language. We don't know how. This is a series of guesses thrown together. And, you know, you, you've been a massive dictionary. So at the end of all this, please be aware these are nothing more than suggested meanings. He's a genius. He, he's a hero. But no one listened. Everyone just wanted to Yo, oh, this is brilliant. You've done it. And no one, I don't think anyone ever read the books in the old days. This is the sky here, or heaven. See this little shape? There's the sky there. And we got this is Kroch, which is, I need to look up my dictionary quickly. I'm a little bit rusty, actually. I haven't mean, done so much of this lately. I was living it for a year, and I knew all these straight off the top of my head. Um, here we are in the dictionary. Find easy enough. That's a pot, you see. So you get Krochan, which gives us Kroch, which is forcible. So you kind of get forcible, you are this sky. So we have, that's another little combo we can work out. And you see a bit more about that in the book as well. Anyway, so Horapalo, who we'll come across when we do History of Translation, he's from hundreds of years ago, and he just guessed the whole thing. He had crazy ideas. Like a dog represents a scribe because he barks a lot. I mean, Thomas Young, right back in the beginning, he said, uh, it's, what do you call it? Oh, he put it brilliantly. He basically said it's nonsense anyway, so it's a load of rubbish. And they, they, he's generally discounted apart from now and again when he comes in useful because they're stuck. <laughs> and he said that he also said this means red pit year. I don't know. Anyway, for the king and B, the other half of the symbol, we got this is Sutanet. Remember, that's different to what we had um, in um, the other one. Uh, the guy beginning with M. Forgotten a second. But anyway, his was like Mutz, NTS, Mit. And now we got Sutanet. It's just take your pick time. King of the North and the South. So there we are. Thank you very much for that one. There are more examples in the book. I'm sure you'll enjoy. And things you'll recognise, and you can work through them, and you can see. And I tell you, it, it, you must really start to realise now, this this is a bit more serious. is isn't necessarily just a laugh. This works. And the more you go into it, the more you'll find it. I think the next one we'll do is pictograms, because that is so clever. When you see these whole drawings uh, become a story, and you can read it, that will excite you. Because that's like doing um, crosswords. You know, like doing cryptic crosswords. And the thing with cryptic crosswords is... When you put the words in at the end, they do have to match up. <laughs> you do end up with real words and a real story, and it has to match up your dictionary and everything. So it's not just guessing, okay? This is, there is a, a solution. Um, it's not like yeah, you can just stick extra letters in or words or change the words or change the spellings or increase the number of squares as you might do to cheat a crossword. But anyway, hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, uh, thank you again. All the incoming uh, messages, the orders, the books. The first edition's almost sold out now, so that's... Amazing, really. Uh, so please keep going with that. Cameraglyphics.com to order directly. We've also got an account called Rossi B4 on eBay and on Amazon. You'll find the books. That's Cameraglyphics and Moses in the Hieroglyphs. 
So, until next time, when we do pictograms, which will seriously blow your mind, blew my mind, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, keep the feedback coming. Uh, it's great to hear from you. Let me know how you find the book. I love the fact that so many people are learning it themselves and are saying, yes, this works, and they even come up with their own uh, things that I've missed and new words and stuff. It's brilliant. So until the next time, Heather.